Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship. Nice to have you as we continue in this Easter season, rejoicing the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the victory that he brings us. Um, Just wanted to say a couple things before we get started. The first is I've been told to tell you about a super important summer events information survey. It is in the back. There's a paper version. So for when you leave, grab one of those forms. Um, you'll also be getting one via your email. This is just about some of the stuff that we have coming up about what may have more interest over less interest, what times might be best for certain things, what ideas you may be able to contribute. So um, I'd really appreciate it if you could take a look at one of those. Uh, I also wanted to tell you, if you weren't able to come to the Easter egg hunt, just because you, you put so much blood, sweat, and tears <laughs> into filling all those thousands of Easter eggs, did you hear the count of how many people came to that? Cool. 495 people, like not counting our volunteers, just people who came to the Easter egg hunt, 495 people. It was completely full. It was amazing. So it was a fantastic event. Thank you for all the work you did to put into that. And thank you for everyone who helped in any way that you could. So it was a a fantastic success. We handed out something like 200 Easter storybooks. So that takes you through the Bible passages. And this is an amazing thing. So we're very happy with how that went. So thank you all. Why don't we begin with our call to worship? It's in your bulletin, then we'll sing. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. We sing. Begin in the name of our triune God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will, walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ by his authority alone, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Psalm 148. This is uh, the psalm that that opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, was based upon. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree, and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth. You great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the heaven earth and all the peoples, princes and all the rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his saints, for the people of Israel who are near to him. Praise the Lord. Living Lord, have mercy. Risen Redeemer, have mercy. Lamb of God, risen in victory, grant us your peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, 
Grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our life and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we hear the word of the Lord. The reading for the second Sunday of Easter, come, the first reading comes from Acts chapter 4. The full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the pro proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading for today is from 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not, only for, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. Our Alleluia found in your bulletins. Alleluia. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. 
Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these things are, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. You may be seated. Any children can come on up. Hello. Come on up. Find any spot you like. Good morning. Oh. (laughs) Come on down. Good morning, everyone. How are you? I'm so glad to see you in church because you know what? Jesus is with you today, and that is so awesome. Today, I want to tell you about a very special word that we don't say too often out and about every day, but we say it a bunch in church. It's kind of a special word, so I need you to repeat after me. Okay, listen up. Ready? Repeat after me. Alleluia. Okay, say alleluia. Alleluia. Congregation, alleluia. Alleluia is a very special word that we say at Easter time especially, but then all throughout the year to remember how awesome God is. Alleluia means praise the Lord. Repeat after me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord. So I thought today, first we could see, do you see those banners in the back? See those white banners? That says Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And then see the white banner over there? It says Alleluia, He has risen. These remind us that we have reasons to praise the Lord. And so I thought we could go over a few of those today and you could help me say Alleluia, praise the Lord. So first we need to practice it, okay? Repeat after me. Alleluia. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Okay, can we do that a few times? All right, here's one reason that we can praise the Lord and we can say hallelujah. Ready? Did you know that God made each and every one of you and that he knows you by name? He even knows how many hairs are on your head. And you know the answer is a lot. Yeah, a lot. How many hairs are on your head? Because God knows you because he made you and he loves you so much that he sent you his son to come and die for you and to rise from the dead so that he could come and have you on his own. So, Point one, first thing, God knows me. Repeat after me. God knows me. God knows me. Alleluia. Praise, Praise the Lord. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, what else? Um, here's one. Did you know that when you pray to God, God hears you? Yeah? Because you're a child of God. When you pray to God and you talk to God, he hears you. And he hears what you need, and he he knows what you need, and he cares for you. So can we say, Jesus hears me? Go ahead. Jesus hears me. Alleluia. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Lord. Oh, Oh, one more, one more. We could go for like eight years. How about God is always with me? Do you know that? Whenever you feel like you're alone or scared, You're never alone. God is always with you. The Holy Spirit is with you. He loves you and he helps you. So repeat after me. God is always with me. Alleluia. Alleluia. Praise the Lord. Lord. Good job. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for giving us so many reasons to say Alleluia. Praise the Lord. We love you. Thank you for everything you do for us. Now help, help us to praise your name today. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone says, Amen. Thank you for coming up. You can head back to your seats while we sing.
Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, you have redeemed us by the precious blood of Christ. You have given us the victory. Send us out boldly with your word and promise as we know that you have the power to save. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the name of Jesus, amen. Friends in Christ, just before Easter, I saw something online, this study, this statistic, um, and it really grabbed my attention. I think this is something they update every year, and I mentioned this in an email I sent you. I've talked to you a few about it elsewhere, um, but it's this. It's that Seattle is the second least religious metro in the country, the second least religious. Um, and I'm here to confess that I tell you I was wrong about that statistic. Uh, it got updated. <laughs> we're actually the first. Um, we're now the first behind San, or in front of San Francisco now. So sorry about getting that wrong, but uh, yeah, we are the first least religious, religious, least religious metro in the country. And here's how they measure that. They, they consider being actively religious as if you you ever go to any kind of religious service of any, any kind, or you go at most once a year. So if, if you do more than that, you, you are considered religious for this metric. So 64% in this area never attend any sort of religious service, or they attend at most once per year. And this is any religion we're talking about, not just Christian worship. Now, is it any surprise to me that people really need Jesus? No. This is no surprise at all. We all need Jesus. I need Jesus at my best moment in my life. But right in our backyard, just think about this, right here, the, the least religious area in the country. That, that means this. We are in a true mission field. This is what we're going to be thinking about today. Ed Stemple, who anytime I talk about him in a sermon, he's not here. He's going to see the eclipse. Sounds a lot of fun. Yeah. Awesome, awesome thing in God's creation. He told me an awesome story. He came up to me at the Easter egg hunt, and he said, hey, do you want proof that we live in an unchurched area and that there are unchurched people here? You know what he, you know what he said? He said some, two kids walked in, two little girls, and looked around at our facilities and said, huh, is it a school or a restaurant? <laughs> and the one said, oh, it's just a school. N nothing... Right? No thought in their mind about that this could be a church, right? That it's just not even what they're thinking about. Yeah, it's a kid, but still, it kind of shows the point. We are in a mission field. People don't know this. And, and, you know, sometimes the mission field is even closer than that. You know this so well. Closer in our own homes, right? How many people in this area could say, oh, all of my family is actively Christian. They're, they're practicing Christian. They believe it's in your home, it's in your extended families, it's your friends. This is a mission field that's close to home. But the thing is, I mean, this is Easter. There's a gospel that we proclaim. What we, we get to proclaim as we say our hallelujahs is that Christ is risen, and that means in this world that so badly needs a Savior, right, that there is a Savior who's alive. There is a Savior who is saving. He has died, he has risen, he's alive. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. Right? This means there is good news. And so what I'd like us to think about today is something that can be a little uncomfortable. Something that we might not like to talk about all that much when we think about actually putting it into practice. And that's witnessing. Witnessing as in telling people about Jesus. And here's why. I think that today there's a really big fear about witnessing big fear about it, about sharing our faith. And sometimes that's a misplaced fear. And to be clear, when I say witnessing today, what I'm referring to is not necessarily big uh, international missions or, or selling everything you have to be a street preacher wandering the earth or something like that. Uh, th this could be effective stuff, but that's not what I'm talking about today. What I'm thinking is even more casually than that, the everyday conversations. So that if you think about your life, and you think about the past, I'm guessing that most of us can think of times when you had an opportunity to say something about your faith, but maybe you didn't, right? You were, oh, this is the, the perfect moment, should I say it? And then kind of succumb to fear. I have been there many times. This is what we're talking about today. 
Why might we be afraid to do something like this? Why might we be afraid to share Jesus to people close to us in our lives? I mean, in some ways, I think it's because we're in an individualistic culture, right? This culture is very much, you do you, I'll do what's good for me, it's fine. I don't want to get in the way of you doing you. Um, It doesn't feel right. And so even though we know that people need Jesus, we think, oh, I'll just keep it to myself, right? This is a reason we might be afraid. Why else? We have a a fear of shame. We don't want to be ashamed, We don't want to feel shame for saying something about what we believe. What will they think of me? How will they react? Will they like me? Will they reject me? Will they think less of me? Why else might we be afraid? Maybe that we're afraid that we aren't the right person for the job because we have limitations. Anyone in this room have limitations? Anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Put it in the air. Yes. I'm not smart enough. I'm not eloquent enough. I'm not creative enough. I'm not confident enough. I don't know all the answers anyone could ever ask. I don't have enough scripture memorized, whatever it is. These things that make us think, oh, maybe I'm not the right one to talk right now. And so we push it down and lock it up out of fear. So I want to tell you a story about some people who were afraid one day. It's the disciples, 10 of them. Oh, and I want you to picture this. It's Easter morning, right? What's happened? Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Oh my gosh, she's going to help un- right, bring spices and stuff and take care of the body. And she goes to the tomb. She, she sees it's empty. And so she goes running from the tomb. She tells Peter and John, hey, the tomb is empty. Come and see. She shows them the empty tomb. They go back home. She stays at the tomb, okay? And Jesus comes up to her. And, sa- and shows her that he is risen, he is alive, there is hope, just as he promised to do. This is exactly what he promised for them. And so then she goes and she tells the disciples, the tomb's not only empty, your, your friend, your Savior is alive. And so what do you think they did? as this gospel takes root in their lives, right? They, they jump up, they, they get out on the rooftops, and they start proclaiming, Jesus is risen. Is that what they do? What happened in our reading? Do you remember? They were locked up in fear. They locked the door out of fear. After all, their Lord was rejected and killed. What would happen to them? Ah. <sighs> Jesus comes to them alive that day. All but Thomas there see Jesus. He gives them the Holy Spirit, the forgiveness of sins to go and speak to to people. Now, right? Now is the moment they jump up and they go. Is that what happened? Well, we don't know everything about what happened after that. We know that they tell Thomas. And then we know that eight days later, the doors are locked again. Is it for the same reason? I don't know exactly, but maybe, maybe it's fear again. Until Jesus comes once again, and they see with their eyes the gospel that Jesus is alive, the one who died for them and for you is alive, their salvation, their hope, their joy. And then something changes. By the grace of God alone, by the grace of God alone, the story that was so rooted in fear turns into something so much bigger. The story takes a turn. I I mean, with I want to give you two, just two stories of this, but there are so many. In Acts 4, we heard one of them. It's just a short little passage. We hear that the disciples are testifying to Jesus, and that testifying word is the witnessing word. They're testifying about Jesus. They're sharing the good news, and people believe. They are out proclaiming the gospel. Here's another one. You remember Doubting Thomas? We heard about him in the text, right? He's known for that doubting. (laughs) Poor guy. I got to touch Jesus' wounds, Thomas. Well, there's something that we don't remember as much about him. Tradition has it he's not only known for doubting. Did you know that Thomas is known for carrying the gospel all the way to India? As the very first missionary to India. He planted countless churches. People heard the gospel, and there's this Christian connection there. Imagine being being a missionary to India later on, going and thinking, I'm going to take the gospel for the first time all the way to India, and then you show up, and oh, we've known that for centuries. Thomas told us. 
How cool is that? He went all the way to India witnessing about Jesus. It took root in people until the day he was martyred. And by the way, you know what the word for martyr is? It, it means to witness. See, by the, God, the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit, they did not stay locked up in fear. They bore witness. And it's not that they were just these superstar Christians, these people who are never afraid of anything or who had all the answers. That is not what witnessing is. Witnessing can be this big, lofty, impressive thing with creativity and, and eloquent speech and arguments and apologetics, but it does not have to be that. Right, hear this, it does not have to be that. It's not about being perfect. It's not about being the smartest person in the room. It's not about having all the answers. It's not about us at all. That's the good news. It's all about pointing to whom? Jesus on the cross. It's all about pointing to Jesus who's alive, knowing that he has the power and the love to save, saying he, he's the one who saved me. And there's plenty more salvation for you too. That's what witnessing is. I, I want to give you a couple ways to picture this. Witnessing is like the witness stand in a courtroom. Sometimes we get so, so worried about, oh, what, what, how do I present this in a way that's going to click? Witnessing is like being on that witness stand. What does the judge want you to do? Does he want you to embellish? Does the judge want you to come up with this big old story and do something that will really grab people's attention? No. The judge wants you to get up there and tell the truth. What do you know? What happened? You just say it. Here's another way. I didn't come up with this one. This is a famous example. Witnessing about Christ is like one beggar telling another beggar where they got the bread. So you picture a big truck. They're handing out free bread. There's more than they could possibly even give out. It's all going to go to waste. And you go and you find bread. You have plenty for yourself. And then you say, you find someone else who needs bread. And you say, oh, I don't want to tell them about that. What if they don't like it? No, you say, oh, the bread's over there. There's plenty for you. This is what witnessing about Jesus is like, is saying, oh, you need hope? Look over there. Oh, you're looking for where truth is in this confusing world? Look over there. You're pointing to Jesus. See, both of these witnessing examples, they show us that it's not really all about us, as we might think it is. We're pointing to Jesus. Scripture says that we're like jars of clay, We have this treasure inside of us. It's Jesus Christ. And today, he is still at work, people. He is working his mission to save by the blood of the cross and the power of that empty tomb, by the the word of the gospel. I know this is the case, and here's how. He hasn't come back yet, and the tomb is still empty. The work of God is still going. And this is where we find ourselves. In this region that is now the first least religious metro in the country, in a mission field where people need Jesus, people for whom there is a risen living Savior. This is the case for your homes that are of mixed faiths, of children who have fallen away. Maybe your spouse doesn't believe. Maybe you have grandchildren who aren't churched. Maybe you have nieces and nephews with unbelieving parents neighbors, friends. Maybe it's the the church having a bunch of neighborhoods around us of unchurched people. This is the mission field, and there is a Savior for them. There is a gospel for them, and we're pointing to Jesus. That's what we're called to do, and so what might this look like, right? What might this look like? It's not always as complicated as you might think, sometimes it really is the cheesy answers, like invite people to church or something like that. That can so often be the most effective stuff. It could be so subtle. You don't want to just go and shove this stuff down people's throats to the point where you, they see you walk and they say, oh, there's that person who won't talk about anything but their church. Sometimes that's not the right approach. Sometimes it is. No. So so truly, one of the most effective ways is to invite someone to something because people are searching for community in this world. 
And it turns out when you're exposed to a community, you see what that community stands for. And this one stands for Jesus Christ who went to the cross for us. Some of you have shared how you've run into someone and invited them to church or to uh, one of the Bible study groups, maybe one of the social groups, and they're surprisingly receptive to it. It's actually kind of amazing. You don't have to sit there convincing them of the gospel. You invite them and they're receptive. You invite them to worship. You invite them to one of the Bible study groups, to a social groups, to hang out with members of the congregation. This can be witnessing. It, it might be hearing someone close to you talking about something really difficult going on in their life. And you simply saying, can I pray for you? And, and here's the kicker. Then actually like in that moment, praying for them. An amazing thing. And guess what you can do in that prayer? Point them to Jesus. Uh, that's a witness. Witness can be intentionally raising your children in the faith, right? Seeing this as an active thing in your life, seeing your role as a parent to raise them in the way of Christ. Witnessing, if, you're, if your children, as many of you have talked about, have fallen away, witnessing can be continually being a light in their life that points you to the Christ who loves them. Witnessing might be taking an active role in the life of grandchildren or nieces or nephews or others in unchurched families and being that connection to the faith. Some of you have talked about this too, uh, about teaching them the catechism or giving them Bibles or taking them to church, praying for them, praying with them. This is witnessing. This is what it looks like. Witnessing might be putting 1 Peter 3.15 in action. Right? Always being ready to give a, a reason for the hope that is in you. Some of you have shared moments where you, you're going through something just so difficult, something like cancer treatment, and then what happens is you're exposed to other people who are going through the very same thing as you, and some of them have no hope in their lives. And they're hurting and longing for hope, and you're able to be there alongside them, truly understanding what they're going through, and able to give them the hope of Jesus, giving them a reason for the hope that is in you. This is an amazing opportunity. The, the list could keep on going and going and going. It's whatever in your life points people who are close to you to Jesus. And I want you to know that when you do this, I know this is a lot, there are some promises of God that are for you. Okay, this is a lot, and you are not alone in any of this. Here's the first one. We all know there are times in our lives when we have spoken. We should have spoken, but we didn't speak. And so if you feel guilt for moments you didn't speak, I want you to hear the words of the epistle reading. Go back and read that. Hearing about the faithfulness of God to forgive because you have a Savior. Your God is faithful to forgive you in the name of Jesus. Your failures are forgiven in the name of Jesus by the grace of God. This is true. You have another promise. You ever think to yourself, gosh, I want to share the gospel with someone, but why am I even going to bother? Because they don't seem to listen. Well, here's a promise. This is a promise of God. Romans says that faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. That is a promise. This is God working through the word. Here's another. God is working with the gospel, the word of the gospel. He is working in that gospel. Paul tells us it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. And that word power in the Greek is dynamis. You could hear the word dynamite in there. It's power. So if you ever think, why am I going to bother to speak? Because it might not work. Because it's the power of God, not your power. It's the power of God. And faith comes by hearing. This is how God is saving people. And if you ever doubt this, I have an activity for you. This isn't a Bible. You can imagine it is. You go in front of a mirror, open up to Ephesians 2, look in the mirror, and read it to yourself about how you're dead in sin. This is how you were born. You're dead in sin. Keep on reading about how he made you alive. That was a miracle, what God did in each and every one of you, and he does that through his word in the lives of others too. That's a promise. Promise three, you are not alone. You bear the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we could say, ah, oh, why, why am I the one to do this? I shouldn't be the one. Excuse me, Mr. Mrs. Miss you. Uh, are you a Christian? Raise your hand. All right, there we go. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit. 
The living God is in you. That's amazing. Praise God. That's a promise of God. Promise four, you have been honored by God. So often we're afraid of, of being shamed or ashamed for our faith. But you have already received the, the biggest honor you could even imagine. Christ in his death and resurrection and in your baptism has honored you in amazing ways. Made you heirs of heaven. Given you a seat at his own table. He's given you everything. Fellowship with God. This is a promise. Last one. Christ has the last word for you. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory in Jesus Christ. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. See, there is so much to fear. And yet when Christ has the victory, he will always have the last word. Because the tomb will always be empty. And we always have this foundation to rest upon. And so all of these promises come together to mean that the Lord is still saving sinners by the gospel just as he saved you. Go in peace. Go in the promise of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's stand together and confess together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into heaven. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. You ever want proof that a pastor ain't perfect? You hear me confessing that he descended into heaven little word flub. It happens. There's forgiveness in the Lord. Let's gather our offering. For prayer. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, we gather today as your people because you have gathered us as your own. By the gospel, you have found us. By your son, you have saved us. By baptism, you have washed us. In our lives, in various ways, we go astray. We follow our own will. So draw us back always to the way of your Son and to find our identity, our security, our peace, our hope in his blood. 
Nourish us in the faith, we pray, leading us to trust in you above all, instilling in us hearts inclined toward Jesus. And help us each day of our lives as your people to point others to Jesus, that they too would know his saving gift. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we lift up Concordia Lutheran School. We lift up Arrowhead Inglemore Preschool. Father, each and every student in these schools is your very own create, creature. And so we pray for each of them. In particular, we pray for the, all the ways they learn about Jesus there, that they and their families would rejoice to know you. Bless all the teachers and administrators as they serve according to your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for all who serve in leadership positions across our nation. We pray for your will to be done through their hands and feet. Give them wisdom to carry out their responsibilities in a way pleasing to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray today for Roger and Jan as we pray, Lord, that you would guide them every day of their life. We pray for Beth and John for strength, for healing, for help. We pray for Lou that you would assure him that you are with him each day. And we pray for Pat as she rests in you each day. We pray for our sister in Christ, Carol, with current medical concerns. Lord, you are the, the great physician of body and soul, and so we pray for you to be with her always and for healing according to your will. We ask your help for each of them and for any others who are on our hearts today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For these and for all our needs of body and soul, we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. At this time, I'd like to say a special prayer. Um, if you haven't heard, there's some bittersweet news. Uh, our dear friends, Rachel, Caleb, and Colton, are going to be putting down some new roots in a different part of the country over in Des Moines, Iowa. We are so happy for, for the, the opportunities that the Lord has given um, it's bittersweet because oh, I officiated your wedding. I baptized your son, right? We're going to miss having you here all the time, but we rejoice that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we pray the Lord's richest blessings upon you. And so let's pray. Lord God, on this day, I, I give you thanks for Rachel, Caleb, and Colton. And so I, I pray, Lord, we lift them up as they prepare to move to a new home. God bless them as they put down these new roots as your people. We thank you for blessing us with their fellowship over all these years. Grant them your Holy Spirit always and your strength during this time of change as you grant all of these great blessings. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But before you go... We have a meal that binds us together. One of the cool things about Holy Communion is this is a table that we share with all Christians, whether or not they are here in this building, which means that as we commune here, receiving the very body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins, he's truly present here, that we are also bound together with all Christians, no matter where they are. That makes us a very special meal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb who is sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death. By his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels, archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying.
Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We stand. Psalm 148, verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks to you that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing. Go in peace, serve the Lord.